Today, I want to tell you a story about Final Fantasy XIV that you may or may not be familiar with. A story about righting wrongs, about a community united, and that sometimes it's a good idea to be careful what you wish for. The release of Heaven's Ward in June of 2015 was a completely different time compared to the FF14 of today. The MMO was still finding its feet off the back of a major relaunch, and it was clear that the developers were still in the process of developing a format and structure that proved successful in all aspects. A Realm Reborn had done great, and had pulled the title back from the jaws of permanent shutdown, but they weren't out of the woods yet, they needed a second hit to prove that there was staying power. Heaven's Ward was a gambit, a risky entry focusing on character-driven narrative, adding complexity to combat systems, and expanding the world. The writers weren't afraid to make bold moves either, such as killing off fan-favourite character Harshafon in a brutal fashion. This death reverberated within FF14's community, and to this very day, people recall it as one of the most emotionally impactful moments that they've had in this decade-long game. Shirts were made, memorials were hosted, and great loss was felt. But what if you could change history? What if you could save it? In 2017, the first Ultimate Encounter was implemented, an entirely new difficulty of content that stood head and shoulders above the rest. The Unending Coil of Bahamut and the Weapons Refrain released in Winter 2017 and Summer 2018 respectively, and they covered both the main story and the raid story from A Realm Reborn. Yukob in particular shook the raiding community to its very core because it was such a vast step up in difficulty from anything that had come before it that players simply weren't prepared for. How could they be? An almost 20 minute long marathon requiring precise execution, memorization of complex multi-layered mechanics, and excellent rotational gameplay and team play throughout. The best groups in the world would spend a week plus of full-time gaming to practice, solve, and eventually clear a single one of these fights. They were that hard, and instead of being completely original encounters, they would instead be ballads sung of previously released fan favourite moments from the game's past. But the community loved the challenge, and they rose to it, eventually coming out the victors. Anticipation was high amongst players to see what the developers would do to pay homage to Heavensward, how its trials and tribulations would be covered in Ultimates. Then, Shadowbringers released in 2019 to massive critical acclaim, and just a handful of months later, accompanying its 5.1 patch, came the Epic of Alexander, the ultimate raid themed around Heaven's Ward's Alexander raid series. This was another massive success, and despite some small controversies regarding the core puzzle mechanic Enigma Codex, and ended in the loss of the ability to place waymarks in combat, thanks to a third-party tool used by the World First group. This raid set the bar even higher in terms of spectacle and the creativity of the mechanics we could expect. All eyes looked to 5.3, where an ultimate was scheduled to release that was hyped unlike any other, one which would cover the main Heavensward story, the Dragonsong War, in all its glory. It was then the disaster struck. The pandemic hit, and understandably, the development team struggled to effectively move game production from their office to a working from home environment quickly. Patch 5.3 was delayed for months due to this upheaval, and the ultimate release was subsequently postponed until patch 5.5, which wouldn't come for the better part of a year. After a long wait, biding their time, raiders tuned into the live letter showcasing the features of patch 5.5, only to see this. The raid had been delayed again, this time until patch 6.1 of the next expansion, Endwalker. Were it to release on time, this would mean an almost three year gap between the Epic of Alexander and this new ultimate. What the live letter did tease though, was that this ultimate would focus on the Dragonsong War in a what-if scenario. What could that mean? 
This was the first time an Ultimate release had deviated from the broad strokes of what had actually happened. Endwalker was the perfect storm. In the months leading up to the expansion launch, the game saw a massive influx of World of Warcraft players, tired of the current state of their game, following in the footsteps of massive content creators like Asmongold. Damn! The launch was insanely successful, reaching never-before-seen player counts. The story almost universally adored, and the implementation of brand new jobs such as Reaper and Sage had expanded the job portfolio to a whopping total of 19. And in the trailer for patch 6.1, finally, it was time. The date is April 26th, 2022. Servers are coming up soon, and with them comes the release of Dragon Song's Reprise Ultimate, the first Endwalker Ultimate, and what will undoubtedly be the most memorable fight Final Fantasy XIV has seen in over three years. Hundreds of groups are hyped, connected to their Statics Discord calls, and ready to jump in the moment the servers go live. Before the action kicks off, I want to quickly familiarise you with a few of the major teams that you are going to see popping up more than once during this video. Kindred, a popular world racing team. Safety Helmet, featuring everyone's favourite bald American Zeno. The bald samurai, okay. Hit Harder, featuring Stahl and friends from the group that placed world second in the Epic of Alexander race in 2019. What the fuck? Neverland a newly formed non-streaming group that looked like a real contender. Thoughts per second, the world first group from the Epic of Alexander. Kryl, a Japanese group featuring Sasuke himself. This pro is amazing not just for doing the fight. Otter House, No Hit, and Kirana's Tivoli, which is the group that I was healing for. In FF14, there are a lot of groups that just won't stream their progression, including a lot of very competitive top-tier statics, and I won't be mentioning them too much here unless they're especially relevant to the race. With less than an hour to go before the race to World First was set to begin, a screenshot started circulating which put the entire community on edge. This is a picture, which at the time was considered either leaked or doctored, from the unreleased encounter, from a never-seen-before phase. There was no way this could have been spoofed in current Final Fantasy XIV, and there was no explanation for how anyone had got hold of this screenshot. Data mining absolutely happens in FF14, and that information gets circulated fairly publicly, but it's usually limited to buff and debuff icons, text, and weird Fisher-Price versions of the boss models. An actual in-game screenshot from what looked like live gameplay with enemy models and everything seemingly functioning? This wasn't possible. Even if some group had somehow managed the impossible and gotten a private server functioning on current patch with the new ultimate and it didn't implode, there's no way this could realistically be done. With that mystery floating around, the community had to collectively put it to the wayside because servers were going live and the race was beginning. Quest Grab, Ultimate Unlock, Party Up, Q-Pop. What awaits you upon queuing into the instance is this. The exact same bridge you watched Harshafont die on all those years ago. Two Knights of the Heavens Ward stand before you, Sir Adelphal and Sir Grinot. You're going to have to take them both on at once. They start off with an onslaught of simple yet heavy hitting attacks, which groups had little trouble mitigating and burning one of their tank invulnerabilities to pass. And shortly after this, Adelphal jumps away and becomes untargetable, and Grinot ramps up his attacks. Players will be targeted in sets of four with markers on their head, and then shot with these big heavy hitting line AoEs that leave black holes at the wall behind where they hit. These black holes cut down on your movement space for the next mechanic, because if you get too close to them, they tether to you and suck your life points no. right out of you. Once eight black holes have been placed, Adelphal returns to the fight and darts around the arena, 
the party is knocked back and orbs begin to explode everywhere, leaving very little safe space between that and the black holes. The bosses also need to be regularly interrupted to prevent them from healing. Once you manage to pass through these mechanics, a set of markers that had never been seen before in FF14 would rear their ugly heads for the first time. The PlayStation markers. Players would get circle, triangle, X or square above their heads, and they would be linked to the person with the same symbol as them. The pairs would be chained together, a knockback would occur, and then each player would explode with an AoE around them for heavy damage. If the burning chain wasn't broken by being far away from one another after the knockback, you're both going to die. Filthy rats. You can pretty clearly see what needed to happen here. Once you managed to reduce both knights HP to zero, and you needed to do this almost at the exact same time because once one died, the other would immediately begin casting in rage, you'd be pulled into a smaller arena with a third caster knight. Harshafant would run to your defense as a spear comes flying across the arena to your group, and he stops it in his tracks with his shield. Shockwaves pulse, and as you deal with the simple mechanics of baiting cleaves and dropping puddles whilst DPSing down the boss, you helplessly watch him struggle. Dead. What's going on? Oh no! Look, you know what's coming? Look on the yep. left! Of the... That's our. Oh no! That's oh no! Friend. No! He's... This phase went by pretty quickly because every mechanic was pretty easy in terms of execution. It was just fighting through the hurdle of initially solving what needed to be done and how to figure out exact positioning and organization for the PlayStation markers that took a few pulls. After just over an hour since the servers came up, the first groups were watching Harshafant 4 and pushing the Caster Knight to sub 30% which was a requirement to beat his Enrage. Otterhouse and Kryle both led the charge, seeing transition with enough players alive and watching the arena change to King Thordens, marking the start of Phase 2. I will. Oh my god! Asklon's uh. mercy concealed. Oh! Oh! oh. To one side. That's a frontal. That's a frontal. I think oh. that's a frontal tank cleave. That gave him a damage down though. I think wait, that's a wait, what? Oh, wait, what, what? The, what? the first wall had been broken. This was shocking. There was a checkpoint in the encounter after you successfully landed your first attack on Thordon, so you didn't have to do the first phase again for the remainder of the two hour lockout. This had never happened before in an ultimate encounter. Outcry erupted on message boards and in Twitch chats as the Reddit detectives gave their two cents on the topic. Claims that this ultimate would be the easiest ever, and complaints that the checkpoint would ruin the encounter were abundant. I don't think it's a spoiler to say that these concerns amounted to absolutely nothing, because what was to come were some of the best and most exciting moments in the game's history. As the four running statics began pulling P2, the rest of the competitors quickly caught up. After a few simple mechanics, Thordon began casting Strength of the Ward, his first major mechanic, and any raiding veteran immediately knew what they were witnessing the moment the boss became untargetable. Trios. So ever since UCOB, these big set piece mechanics which would throw intense combinations of previously standalone savage mechanics started being introduced. They'd be combined in new configurations to offer harder tests. Usually there would be a few trios in quick succession with damage phases on the boss breaking them up. This was very clearly going to be a trio centric phase where damage on the boss would come naturally as long as mechanics were passed with 8 players alive. At the end of the cast of Strength of the Ward, 3 of the Heaven's Ward Knights will appear around the edge of the arena and dive in a straight line, rendering most of the floor space a death zone. Players need to spread within those 2 small safe spots, because each is going to take a small AoE damage on themselves. Then a third knight will slam down a pulsing circular ballast that needs to be dodged in combination with setting up to avoid delayed line AoEs on each player from Thordon. Then, and yeah that's right, that's only the first half of the mechanic, three players will get blue markers on their head indicating they're about to get slam dunked. Two knights will spawn in the arena with tethers that tanks need to grab because they're both tank busters. Six towers will spawn and growing red AoEs appear all over the floor. This was a mess. If a tower was missed, it was a wipe. If a blue AoE was too close to the group, it was a wipe. If a tank misplaced their tether, 
It was probably a wipe. This mechanic was intensely punishing, but groups pushed through. After this, they got a brief respite, aside from the tank who just got hit in the face a few more times, followed by the cast of a mechanic that will definitely be memorable for most of the racing teams, Sanctity of the Ward. This was essentially two trios in one. The first was simple in concept. A giant red eye would appear on the edge of the room, as would Thorden. Don't look at them. Knights would spawn in the room, and two random players would get a one or two sword on their heads. The players would be leapt on in order by the Dark Knight twice, which was a shared damage that needed three to four players to survive, and also did damage based on proximity. So the one group would need to be away from the knight, with the two group being behind his initial spot. This seems super doable, until you factor in the fact that the arena at the time looked like this. Winnable? Or you could just do this. Holy shit, Valor. No, focus, 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 focus. focus. <laughs> Once you make it through this mechanic, at the time with a lot of clenching involved while the sequence was still being learned, things just got worse. The arena blocks off with fire and ice puddles, random configurations of towers spawn, some inside near the middle, some on the edge, two players are marked, and shortly players will need to split themselves off into pairs to cancel out fire and ice AoEs that will target themselves. Then, players need to grab those towers and the two marked people need to set up roughly opposite one another on the outside of the arena and then run a half circle around, baiting the meteors that will drop on top of them one by one. A second set of eight towers spawn, this time not random, all on the edge, a knockback happens, and players need to end up in those eight towers. In theory, this mechanic sounds like a lot of very simple things on top of each other, and it is. The issue is that there is so much randomization that a number of rules needed to be made to deal with every single permutation. There was a chance to need to swap meteor positions, to have players swap spots. There were so many variables that solving this consistently wasn't going to be a simple task. Groups spent hours here, bashing their heads against this one mechanic to hone their strategies and develop a workaround for every new pattern that arose. There were alternative solutions too. <clears throat> Holy shit, Lord. Whoa, <laughs> like, what? Hey, Lord? Whoa, Fuck damn. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Once you manage to get through this mechanic, Thorden and his knights would rally together and cast Ultimate End, causing massive group damage. If you survived, he'd be so taken aback that he'd start panicking. And if you made it through to this point relatively cleanly, a kill was absolutely in sight. And so, one by one, the kills came in. Groups were still pretty close to one another at this stage, and in the later stages of day one, Thorden met his end. Time for phase three. Astinian, corrupted by the power of Nidhogg's eye, bursts into the arena with one of the coolest raid wides I've ever seen, and immediately begun stabbing the tank. I'm just going to say it now, in advance. This phase is something else. The core mechanic of Phase 3 is that certain players will need to place towers for other members of the raid to later take, but the way you do it is so, so fun. Three people will be marked with a 1, 2 with a 2, and 3 with a 3. This number dictates the order in which you're going to drop towers for other members of the raid to take. You can't take your own tower, you can't take two towers, and there are heavy stacks going off at the same time that require around five people in them. So putting people in the exact right places at the exact right times consistently was a requirement. Once you take a tower, a clone will drop in place of it and will shoot a massive line AoE in a few seconds, targeting the closest person. The player that took the tower will want to face this away from danger and then avoid. On top of this, Nidstinian is doing cast bar telegraphed in and out dodges, and sometimes your tower placement can instead be marked with an arrow. If it is, that means that you are not going to place a tower on your current position, but in the direction of your arrow instead. This added an additional foil and thing to think about as it randomly made certain numbers a lot stricter to plan out during prog. This entire mechanic is an absolute masterpiece. The timing of everything feels fast enough to be exhilarating, but just slow enough that the chaos is controlled. There's a decent chunk of damage going out on the party, 
but competent healers were quickly able to optimize their damage and play perfectly. Every member of the group had to engage with this dance and had a number of possible safe spots they'd need to take. And because the boss never jumped away, it really rewarded groups that were able to build uptime strategies quickly with a more lenient enrage later down the line. Honestly, thinking back on it, this phase on the whole is definitely a contender for my favourite ultimate phase ever. There was a weird bug that could occur that people refer to as the Brazil Tower, but this was patched out pretty quickly so it's not too bad. Once you deal with the entire Die From Grace sequence, four towers spawn in the Intercardinals. But these are special towers, because some of them have three towers inside, or four, because they're silly little guys. There will always be eight players required in these towers in total, but they will rarely be evenly split 2-2-2-2. Two, 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 two. Instead, players have to adjust to these random tower configurations to stop them from going boo. After this, Nidstinian clones drop to be baited, and one of the four at random will get a tank buster tether instead. The boss will have a second tether, so both tanks need to grab them and pray. These are some of the hardest hitting busters, relatively speaking, in the game. So if tanks weren't prepared, it could get really, really risky, really, really quickly. Following this, the enrage sequence begun. This is a good time for me to mention that the damage downs in DSR were truly evil. Two minutes long, and cutting your overall DPS down so substantially that the best course of action if you got one was usually to die at the next possible moment, and no, I'm not kidding. If a player held the damage down throughout a phase, it was highly likely that you just were not going to meet the DPS check. The checks had not been completely insane, but they were definitely tight enough to demand mostly clean play from eight competent players. So before phase three could be downed, everybody needed practice. Luckily by this point, Limit Break 3 had been generated, so we were on the cusp of seeing a brand new phase. One thing to notice here is that the Dragonsong War Gauge on the duty list was filling up very quickly. Right now, the furthest groups were barely 6 minutes into the fight, and yet this gauge is almost full. Combined with the checkpoint, could this be a new, more casual, friendly style of ultimate? People were concerned about what exactly was happening here. Was there a twist? Then, out of nowhere, Thoughts Per Second posted a clip on Twitter. The group themselves were not streaming their prog, but from what little footage they had shown, they were miles ahead of the competition. A previously unseen phase? And no less, what looked to be an enrage of that phase? How far ahead could they be? Nonetheless, we didn't have to wait long to find out, because No Hit managed to down Nidhogg shortly afterwards and make a real headway into a brand new phase before they promptly ended their stream to hide their new knowledge from the competition. Cryl followed soon after, and then we were on to phase four. You get it, get it, get it! As the Dragonsong War progress gauge ticks up following Astinian's defeat, the arena shifts to the final steps of faith, the scene of the last confrontation with Nidhogg at the end of the original main scenario quests. Alphano runs in from the south of the arena to assist his friend Astinian, who is bound and broken between the eyes of Nidhogg. He begs us to finish him, and in response, the Ghost of Harshafant blesses us with the Soul of Friendship buff. At the same time, Alphano pulses the soul of devotion from around him. The eyes grow, surging with power, and the phase begins. These two buffs are a requirement to be able to deal damage to the eyes. Each buff corresponds to one of the eyes, and possessing the buff means that you can hit them. This was the first point of contention between groups. It was totally possible to stack both buffs together. But was this the right idea? Would this bite groups in the butt later down the road? Why is it that there are two separate buffs obtained in two separate ways? 
thanks to the puzzle elements that Ultimates have traditionally introduced. It was definitely within the realm of possibility that the correct play was to split the buffs to avoid some unseen failure state later. For the sake of progression though, most groups opted to take the risk and stack the buffs together, allowing them to double dot and cleave both eyes, making the DPS check much, much easier. So let's break down how this phase actually works. The red eye will tether four players with red chains, and the blue eye will tether four players with blue chains. Players that take damage while linked to the red chain will deal a chunk of damage to the red eye, whereas when players with the blue chain take damage, they heal the blue eye. You can trade tethers with another person by standing on top of them for a second or so, so the goal of this phase is to create a setup which has the players about to be hit with the red chain and avoid taking damage as a blue chain. Three orbs spawn around each eye, a large yellow orb and two blue orbs. Yellow orbs should be popped by two players and blues by one. After a period of time, the blue orbs would grow and if you left them too long after that point, they would explode, killing everyone. Growing an orb would make them deal more damage to whoever popped them, and if you consider how the chains work, it's pretty easy to see why that may be a good thing. So you'd pop the yellow orbs, trade the chains, and then pop the four blue orbs, chunking the red eye. Next, players with a red chain will be dived in sets of two by mirage dives from Nidstidian clones. These do massive damage and apply a volm, so if you take two in a row, you die. This happens four times in total, for eight dives overall. So the goal is simply to trade tethers between dives to make sure that nobody with a Volna possesses a red dive. The eyes are then going to cast Steep Enrage, and this acts as a pseudo enrage for the phase, because each eye does this attack individually. So if both happen to be alive at this point, they're both going to cast the heavy hitting raid wides, and taking two of them at once was very close to unsurvivable. The ice phase was deceptive, because the difficulty in the ice phase was not in solving the mechanics, or even in executing them. On the whole, this was honestly the easiest phase to execute in the encounter so far aside from the pre-checkpoint door boss. The biggest issue with the ice phase is that they had a relatively tight DPS check that required clean play and no accidental friendly fire on the blue chains and the groups were just getting deep enough into DSR to fall victim to the consistency check. The hardest part of progging eyes was seeing eyes, and this was where groups had to really focus on building their consistency. A new goal became not only progging and killing eyes, but bringing Limit Break 3 over from the previous phase without using it. This would free up a melee or ranged LB3 if needed to lessen the strain of the eyes in rage, or even to keep further into the fight. As the leading groups were approaching the eyes in rage, once again, the TPS Twitter reared its head, posting this clip without context. <laughs> A clock? Rolling back? What could this mean? They had clearly gotten past eyes and seen something new, and soon enough, Cryo would become the first stream group to see exactly what had been hidden from this clip. This was where the race evolved from good to incredible. なにこれ。これが新しい。これが新しい。あ、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと。あ、ちょっと。あ、ちょっと。あ、ちょっと。あ、ちょっと。あ、ちょっと。あ、ちょっと。あ、ちょっ
At the exact moment that Harshafon dies protecting you, at the end of Phase 1, you must play out events again, just the way they happened the first time. Watching your friend fall, defeating Sir Charibur, and phasing back into Thorden. It was a time loop. This was mind-blowing. In the second loop, everything was the exact same as the first. You didn't have some extra buff, there were no new mechanics, nothing. You just tried and failed again. What on earth was going on here? What were you supposed to do? Was it possible to save him? As the other groups one by one caught up and witnessed Rewind for themselves? It was time to figure this out. There were a few things here of note that became the four running theories and groups essentially had to pick their poison as to which one they tried first. First up was completing a second loop in its entirety. Honestly, this one I think was pretty cope, and it was the last thing that most groups were opting to even consider trying because it just seemed so unlikely. From a design standpoint, doing the same fight twice would make no sense at all. With misaligned cooldowns, it became crushingly hard to consistently meet the DPS check. And honestly, the other options that I'm about to outline next just seemed stronger. The second was splitting the buffs in eyes. This one also seemed kind of cope, kind of unrelated, but no group had successfully managed this yet, so it was definitely a fallback solution that groups could rely on if the most likely scenario failed miserably. Thirdly, before I explain, I want to take you back to phase 1 for a second to look at something. You see the limit break bar here? There are only two gauges, which is usually reserved for light party content. Where was the third LB gauge? Why did you only receive it when you transitioned to the Thorden checkpoint? This had been raised a few times as a little quirk or point of interest by a few groups so far and even in Twitch chats, but it had been pretty irrelevant so it was kind of ignored, there was no point paying too much attention to it. But now, now it was suddenly incredibly important, because after Rewind, you get pulled back into this phase, but with access to a possible LB3, something completely unobtainable before. This had to be it. But before it was even possible to trial, groups had to majorly optimise the previous phases in order to bring across LB3 to rewind. During prog so far, it was commonly done to use LB3 to kill either Nidhogg or Eyes. But in order to test either of these theories, both of those phases had to be downed cleanly without the use of Limit Break as a crutch. On the rare pull that a group managed to get far enough to test, they did so, one by one. Melee LB could kill the boss fast enough to free up the group from the mini arena potentially, allowing them to help Harshavon, but it failed. It did not release you from the jail. Healer LB could be used to revive him after he fell in battle, right? Surely Tank LB would protect him from the damage, right? There had to be more to it. Back and forth the viewers went between streams, waiting for another tantalising rewind pull to test a new theory. Kryle tested the heal LB and found that it did not res Harshavon, rendering that option a complete no-go. Kirana's Tivoli tested the tank LB, waiting until he was targetable in the hopes of reducing his incoming damage for as long as possible. And it actually worked! Better yet, it continued mitigating damage on him even after the Limit Break 3 had worn off, but it still wasn't enough. He still died. What was discovered through much trial and error and looking through footage between the four running groups was that if you press the tank LB forward to using it before Harshavon's HP bar appeared, he was actually targetable by Limit Break the entire time. You would remove the debuff on him that prevented him from being healed. This would mean that he had both the damage mitigation for the entire phase from tank LB, and he was able to be healed by the healers and the damage on him from the spear became much, much more manageable. Now the game had changed. Now you could save him. Now the race was on. Once you managed to defeat Sir Charibur while keeping your boy alive, the spear slowly taking his life became targetable, and it was a race against the enraged to defeat it before it defeated him. And the first group to save him on stream? With almost 100,000 viewers in the Final Fantasy XIV category eagerly watching the race, Kryl. Oh. 
Upon saving him, the timeline splits, the Dragon Song War Gauge resets back to zero, and you're thrown into an entirely new setting. Things have gone so very wrong. King Thordon is more powerful than ever, having obtained power over the dragons, and now he brings his full force to bear against you. Now, we had to see the consequences of our actions. We had to see how we'd pay for rewriting history in such a callous manner. This phase opened with a few simple auto-attack cleaves, before jumping right into the Wrath of the Heavens, and as soon as Thordon leapt away, it became clear that he just really likes trios, because this was a second trio phase. Two knights leap down and target one player apiece with a tether, and a dragon jumps down as well and stares menacingly in between them. One player will also receive a blue marker on their head, the exact same one you've seen earlier in the fight all the way back in phase two. As a quick reminder, it means that this player needs to be miles away from everyone else. The knights will dive their targeted player shortly, in line with those tethers, and the dives are huge. On top of that, you have twisters. Wait, wait, with twisters? Yukop twisters? Yeah, yeah, the Yukop twisters are back, except this time they've decided to mess with every single experienced raider by giving them a slightly different snapshot timing than they've ever had before, meaning that all your muscle memory, built up from five years of Yukop clears for friends, completely worthless. Spread the group along one side of the room, let the blue guy stand alone in his blue guy corner, stretch and bait their dives, leaving space for everybody else, and dodge the twisters. As all this is happening, two random players will get thunder marks. One will get a green marker traditionally reserved for dive bomb-like mechanics, and you need to start paying attention to the knights standing menacingly in the arena. Know that there's a caster and a warrior. Thordon will use his invisible line AoE Ascalon's Mercy from phase two, the dive bomb will lock in, so place it away from any future safe spot that you may want to have. One player will get five fireball puddles that they need to bait, and another will get four large pyre AoEs to bait. The thunders will explode for a small AoE around themselves, paralyzing any accidental target that they somehow manage to hit, and the warrior will use a massive donut shaped attack, meaning that close to him in a small circle is the only safe spot left in the room. And yeah, this all goes off at pretty much the exact same time. For one of the only times in this whole video, I'm actually happy to say that this mechanic is easier than it looks. It has a lot of moving parts, that's very true, but all the components and mechanics that you've seen before, and they are all, for the most part, what you see is what you get. If you deal with each of these individual components, you will get the win. By this stage, around 10 minutes into the encounter, Groups had become more accustomed to the randomized nature of most of the mechanics, and the fact that role-based responsibilities had for the most part been thrown out of the window in favor of more randomness in this encounter, without too much struggle, this mechanic also fell. One mildly scary tank buster later, Death of the Heavens begun to cast. I'm gonna spoil it right here, but this is the big one. This was more like death of everybody's prog for at least a day, because it was a wall and a half. When the boss leaves the arena, you're greeted by this complete mess of dragons and knights around and inside the arena, and it can be overwhelming to figure out what you're even looking at, let alone how you're supposed to deal with it. Before I explain the actual solution, I think it's good to mention that one early solution that some groups were electing to try here is blocking the spear from one of the knights. I'm honestly not too sure why they were going for that, because it seemed fairly obvious that it wasn't the right play, but this was one of the earliest attempted solutions. So what happens here? Four random players get Doom, meaning that unless they are cleansed in some way, they're going to go splat when the Doom timer hits zero. Thordon, multiple dragons and knights spawn around the edge of the arena, and the warrior knight spawns inside it and begins channeling the same ballast that he uses in phase two. If you look at the target bar at this point, you're probably going to gulp in fear. Twisting Dive, Cauterize, Wings of Salvation, Spear of the Fury, Lightning Storm, Heavy Impact, all of this is going off pretty much in sync with one another. And the first time pretty much every group got there, they instantly exploded. How are you supposed to develop a strategy for this, when you couldn't even see what was going on because it was such a mess? 
Upon a lot of footage review and further testing, it was clear that most of this was just fluff, supposed to distract you away from what actually mattered. Twisting Dive was relevant because it signified Twisters dropping, and Lightning Storm was relevant too, as it hit each player and required them to spread. Heavy Impact was the ballast, so you could just watch the pulsing AoE and dodge, and the rest just reduced the safe floor space. So what you wanted to do was to funnel players into these six small safe spots before being presented with another issue. The non-dooms drop a puddle as all of this goes off. This has been used before in previous encounters, and it's known as a doom cleansing mechanic. So now it was obvious what you actually needed to do to cleanse that doom. It was not a full HP mechanic, you needed to use the puddles. But don't worry, it gets worse. PlayStation is back and he is joined by his ugly younger brother, Dragon's Eye and the gaze from Thornton. Chains appear once more, a knockback occurs, and the players explode. This is literally the mechanic from Phase 1, but with two lookaways added on top and the requirement to have the dooms end up on the spots that you left the white puddles so that you could cleanse. After all of this, there's a Meteor DPS check in order to ensure that you got through this mechanic mostly cleanly. So you had to get it right. This mechanic was hard. For those of you that are doing DSR today, it was a different experience, because there was little to no knowledge of baitable markers and no advanced strategies based on them. For the first handful of hours, the best attempts were the product of pure adjusting around the other seven people and trying to make some magic happen. Over time, this developed into strategies as groups learnt one another's tendencies and added new rules to slowly add structure into the chaos. Getting the right people to the right safe spots to drop puddles were a major pain point, and once that was overcome, organising PlayStation tethers once the added confusion of the dooms needing to go in certain places felt almost insurmountable. Eventually, after many many hours of trial and error, breakthroughs were made. Hit Harder was one of the four running groups here, with a high level of consistency at getting players far into the mechanic to see more. Kryle pushed forward, getting part of the group to Meteors having resolved the previous part partially successfully. Kirana's Tivoli surpassed them, Ray's cheesing through the Meteor Enrage and seeing the true enrage of the entire phase shortly afterwards, with a handful of players alive to boot. It felt like almost every single forerunning group was at the exact same point, trading good pulls between each other. And one by one, they begun to break the wall. I wanna go to Daddy Torrance Dragon Dungeon. <laughs> this was a great moment for Twitch chat, honestly, and I think it needs a little bit of a mention here. Viewers would hop between streams to whomever was having the best pull going at the time, showering the chat with people arrives whenever prog point was reached and people leaving when the wiper occurred. They'd post cute little references to each of the major streams as they arrived, like Baldo Wig to Village Burned, Banana Peeled, and I mean it when I say this. Twitch chat made this experience ten times more enjoyable. Being cheered on by so many different people, different stream chats collectively coming together to hop between POVs and support each of the four running groups. It was a unique atmosphere that is pretty much impossible to recreate. Following all of this, Thordon simply hit the raid with damage, another spooky scary tank buster and begun channeling his enrage. At this point, if you had the DPS you could kill him. But there was a catch, once he reached 2%, he would stop his enrage, drop to the floor, and begin begging for mercy. This was very odd, this had never happened before, and Final Fantasy XIV raiders have a bit of a soft spot for old men in armour, so the majority consensus from groups getting to this point was, yeah, let's see what happens. And it was clearly some kind of success state, because Thornton had a special animation, additional dialogue, he would escape, leaping away, calling you too kind for your own good. And at long last, the transition to Phase 6 happened. Welcome to the hardest phase in DSR to prog. This phase was a slog, but before I get into why exactly, let's walk you through what's happening quickly. The wandering minstrel recites his verse. A single life can alter the course of history. Enslaved by an ancient relic, the great worm Hrisvelga descended upon Ishgard at his vengeful brother's side. Thanks to our saving of Harshafon and our sparing of Thordon, this is what had happened. Both Nidhogg and Hrisvelga bring their full force to bear against us, cornering your party between the two of them at the final steps of faith. The first mechanic is Worm's Breath, which tethers each of the non-tanks with either an ice tether or a fire tether, three apiece, 
These tethers shoot the targeted player with a fairly thin pizza slice cleave at the end of the cast, and if you had fire, you get pyretic, which forces you to stop moving, and if you had ice, you will be frozen, and thus unable to move. If you get hit by both though, they will cancel one another out, and you get neither. The crux of this mechanic is managing your available space in order to get each of the six players hit twice and only twice, while also having them start off close enough to one another to deal with the randomness of the targeting, especially considering that large tank busters are going off at the same time, so you can't just use the full arena. One random DPS gets marked by Mortal Vow, reducing their ability to heal. This needs to be traded to another player by stacking on expiration, and if that doesn't happen, an enraged state instantly triggers. You'll spend the entire phase juggling this buff between players, hoping no third guy accidentally stands in it and subsequently goes boom. Then comes Akafar, which is honestly the worst mechanic in this entire fight. Both dragons will channel a stack damage on the healers, so split into parties of four, but there's a twist. During this mechanic, both dragons need to be within 3% of HP of one another, or else they are going to tether together and make this stack instantly kill everyone within it. And it is awful to deal with, because this occurs so late in the encounter, and the HP differential is so minimal, and the dragons don't have a large amount of HP to begin with, this all combines to create a punishing mechanic that falls victim to crit variants a lot. And groups had to work really hard and be very aware to make sure that they could keep their DPS's itchy trigger finger from bursting too much during that 5 second window. Then Nidhogg dives and the tanks are hit by huge AoEs that everyone else has to avoid before the cast of Wrath Flames begins. This mechanic was the big prog wall of the phase. Big sets of fireballs would spawn, which will later explode in a plus shape in the order they spawned. Trace Felga this time will dive in the same way Nidhogg did before, rendering a large section of the Steps of Faith a death zone. Nidhogg casts Stack Morn, a multi-hit stack on the group, and with each hit, a dangerous bleed puddle is left on the floor beneath you. You need to move as one, taking all of this damage, avoiding the fireballs and dives and the brand new hot wing or hot tail, and then organize into groups, randomly, based into spreads or different pair stacks that can be randomly assigned based on debuffs. Easy, right? There were a few problems here. Firstly, you had to clear all the way up to this phase, which was an insane consistency check. Then, you had to get through both Worm's Breath and the equal HP check, which were both still pain points for practically every stream group. And once you managed to do all those things and get a life pull on your hands, which could take a solid hour of attempts to do, you then had to deal with the massive incoming damage, the random buffs, and locating the safe spot, and figuring out the best path to direct the Akamon baits in. One word to sum up the progression of this mechanic, punishing. But eventually, after much pain and iteration, strats began to come together. After all this goes down, there's another Akafar equal HP check, which meant the groups had to pay special attention to boss HP immediately after Wrath Flames in order to equalize. Then a bunch more dodging, mortal vow trades, tank busters, and a second worm's breath. Then, the two dragons will get sick of this encounter, jump to the north, and dive you together, killing the raid. This was quickly solved. Nidhogg is fire-coded and Harry's Felga is ice-coded. And you remember how double stacking the fire and ice elements of the worm's breath has them cancel one another out. Well, if you skip that step entirely and go into the dragon dives with the fire or the ice buff, you can use them to cancel out the elements associated with the dives and survive the phase. This is all followed by an enrage sequence. I don't think I can quite put into words how painful double dragons was to blind proc. It was like it was specifically designed to be a prog wall. Equal HP checks, and two of them at that, and numerous mechanics back to back that were just cryptic enough to require trial and error to reach the correct solution and pass. The phase hits hard, too, especially on tanks, and if there wasn't a real plan in place to provide mitigation for each of the many major hits, it was all too easy to watch your main tank hit the mud to a hallowed wing. Your cooldowns were just stretched too thin to be able to overstack anywhere. This phase was so tough due to the pseudo enrage too, which I haven't mentioned yet. You know how dropping the mortal vow without trading it causes an enrage? Well there's another way to get that. If Ray's Velga kills a player through any method, you'll get pop-up text that would become painfully familiar to progging groups, and he will enrage, making his attacks one shot. Phase 6 didn't take hours to prog. It took days. Full, 16 hour day slogs, and multiple of them too. 
solving and perfecting and iterating to reach the end. Just as groups were approaching the end, a tweet came in. Neverland had done it. They'd cleared. World First had been claimed. Until this point, the entire group had been quiet on social media, trading flamboyant shows of how far ahead they were for focus on their own game. And it had absolutely paid off. At this point, no stream group had even seen the final phase of the fight, so it was a testament of just how well those players performed and how much they deserved that win. A massive congratulations to them and the legacy that they built that week. At this point, almost an entire week into Prog, groups were beginning to drop out. Pay time off from work was running out for those that took just a week. Prog was impacting health, and in some cases, DSR was just becoming too much. But for many, the race was still on. There were still placements to claim. There was no confirmed win on stream, no footage of final phase, and everything to play for. No Hit were the first group to see that transition live on stream, followed shortly by Kryl. Thorden absorbs the power of both the slain worms and becomes what he always aspired to be, the Dragon King. This is the product of your choices, this is what you've done, and you need to make it right. His transition goes off with an insanely hard hitting raid wide, and as reality shatters for a moment, the final phase begins. Dragon King Thorden is a simple phase, with only a few mechanics that cycle into the Enrage. Firstly, you have Exaflare's Edge. Exaflares are a regularly recurring mechanic in FF14 since Yukob and are AoEs that indicate with an arrow. They'll pulse, moving in the direction of the arrow, hitting multiple times along the way. These Exaflares were built different though, because they split in three different directions apiece, and with three initial exaflares, you would have nine different pulsing circles of death moving all around the arena, and you needed to find the safe spot. If only it were that easy though, because the boss will also glow with a fire or ice imbuement. If it's fire, you need to be outside the hitbox when the exaflares start. If it's ice, you need to be inside. These fire and ice mechanics accompany each of the three casted abilities, so just assume they're there for both of the other two that I'm about to explain. Luckily, groups found a consistent solution to Exaflare that required basically no thought, because dodging into the rear AoE and then taking a small backstep worked for every single possible pattern, completely removing the need to look at the arrows or think at all. Next came Akmorn's Edge, and based on this naming convention, I think it's fair to assume that Thorden is a bit of an edgy lad. Akmorn's Edge is a set of three multi-hit raid wides, one for the tanks at the back, and two for the rest of the party on the north, west, and east. Each time this mechanic comes back, it hits extra times, and you need a tight mitigation plan to survive because it hits like a truck. Lastly, you had Giga Flare's Edge, which would telegraph three meteors in order, and you simply needed to stand opposite the first one and then move away from each meteor as they go off, healing through the damage. In between each time one of these mechanics occurs, you get to deal with two trinities. It's called Trinity because it, uh, it hits three people. It attacks both tanks and whichever player ends up deepest inside the boss hitbox. Being hit by Trinity as a non-tank gives you a volm up, so you cycle between the six players of the raid to take hits. Tanks get light and dark vulnerability, and they need to regularly tank swap to prevent their stacks from getting too high. That's it. That's everything. Everything I've mentioned cycles through a few times, and then you get to enrage. This was truly a pinnacle final phase, with relatively simple to understand dances, but incredibly punishing ones that made you pay attention to the details. It also wasn't unrecoverable either, because high healer awareness could easily fix a messed up tank swap or a quick adjust and res making up for an unfortunate player death. Phase 7 also hit incredibly hard. The mitigation requirement was tight, and even with good mitt, the outgoing damage was high and precise timing was needed. But this is something that the top groups excel at, and it was certainly not going to hold them back from victory. As more and more groups clawed their way to phase 7, at this point, all eyes were glued to Twitch streams, watching the attempts get closer and closer to victory. And eventually, Kral stepped up. 
This was their moment. They had taken stream first, and it was an emotional finish to be sure. And now, I'm just going to cut to the post victory cutscene and let it play out on its own with no narration. I think it's not an unpopular opinion to say that Dragon Song's reprise changed Final Fantasy XIV for good. It was the first ultimate with such a heavy story focus, and while due to an unfortunate backlash from people who will never do the fight, I think it added to what made it so exciting. People weren't just hyped to see their favourite groups and streamers prog, they were excited to see what would happen next. They were eager to see the alternate timeline, to see if they could save him to witness the twists and turns that would happen along the way. It was also, at the time, without a doubt, the hardest fight in the game's history. In the same way that Yukop took encounters to a whole new level of expectation in 2017, DSR did it again in 2022. People that cleared came out much, much stronger players than they went in. It was an incredible fight with satisfying phases, intense puzzles, and some of the tightest execution checks in the game's history that really pushed the player base to their limits. DSR was special, and really, I wonder if there will ever be anything quite like it ever again. <laughs>